and back of the theater and to locate the exit nearest you. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of the 25th reunion channel. This year we're going to be talking about liberal arts education and the interplay between that and kind of this digital toolkit that's been weaving its way into our lives increasingly every day. And um, we have some fantastic classmates who have put their head in the news a little bit and are going to give us their thoughts on the subject. <laughs> And Susan Engel, who's a professor here at Williams right now, who's going to be our moderator. So, on to the panel. Thank, Thank you so very much. Bye. Supposed to do this, sorry. So first of all, I want to say that even though you graduated 25 years ago, you haven't changed a bit. You're still sitting in the back of the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so. I want to tell you how happy I am to be here with you today. I love teaching at Williams, um, and I'm particularly interested in this topic. I'm also delighted to be with such a wonderful group of uh, your classmates, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. For those of you who don't know me, I don't know if it says it, nah. I teach in the psychology department, and I direct the program in teaching here. And actually, because I'm so old and you're so young, you might have been in one of my classes. Is there anybody in here who had me as a student? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I've changed, um, and so have you. Uh, okay, so we have a really intriguing topic today, which is, um, I'm going to forget the proper title, but it's about the way in which digital toolkits have affected the world of liberal arts college and beyond. And I have to admit that when I first got the email about this, I, I balked and I said, I don't know what a digital toolkit is. But then I, I kind of figured it out. And, um, and I want to just say for a moment a little about my own introduction to this topic, which is that we're here to talk about the ways in which the digital world uh, impacts or influences what we do as professors, as scholars, and as students in liberal arts campuses, and also how the liberal arts world has been affected by the digital world. And I think it's inevitable that we'll be talking at least partly about the pluses and the minuses. And I was just going to say a bit about the pluses, sort of a preview of my pluses and minuses. So. The pluses are that it's opened up the world of knowledge in an amazing way if you're a scholar or trying to get other people to be scholarly. And I keep thinking of this term that I learned from an historian, research rapture, which is when you look something up online and it's so intriguing to you and you find something in there that you didn't know you wanted to know about and then you have to follow that link and then you go to another link and suddenly you look up and it's 10 hours later and you're a specialist in a whole other field. And it's actually a fabulous phrase and it's one I relate to and as someone who studies kids, I understand that in that way, the digital world is a friend to children for all the ways we caution ourselves and our kids about the misuses of the digital world, uh, their devices, it can lead to research rapture, and that's fantastic. As a researcher, I love it also because of all the specific tools it gives me. So I can use Skype as a data collection method and interview people all over the world without leaving my office. That's incredible. Uh, so those are some of the pluses, and I think my, my guest speakers up here are going to talk more about that. But I also want to be honest as a professor and say that it's got some minuses. Um, and I'll just mention uh, two or three. One is that uh, not, a, not so many years ago, I went to observe um, a colleague of mine, another psych professor, a fabulous psych professor. We were observing each other's classrooms as part of a share. Uh, and I was sitting in the back of the room, and everybody had opened their laptops to take notes. And suddenly, I looked to see what notes the student was taking, and lo and behold, he was shopping for shoes. And that actually is just a tiny incident, but it reflects a bigger concern that I bet I see the nods, that a lot of us have a concern with the way in which laptops and iPhones and everything take our students away from us and away from each other. And I actually don't allow laptops in my classroom anymore. And I tell them it's not just so that they won't shop for shoes. It's so that they'll really be with each other in the room and not behind a screen. Um, but there are also other little things. I'm very interested in the way in which um, email and Instagram and texting has encouraged 
uh, a kind of informality that's gone too far. And that's because I sent an email to a student the other day who I didn't know, and I said, I'm writing to you as my capacity on this department, you know, committee, blah, 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 sincerely, Professor Engel or Susan Engel or whatever, and he wrote back, hey, Susan. And I was like, nope, <laughs> too far. Uh, so I think that those are just little ways in which it's both a, a wonderful gift and a, and a problem. One last note about that. Uh, a few years ago, I was in Aspen at a conference, and I happened to hear the founders of Coursera and edX talking about the wonders of learning online, something that some of you may talk about, I don't know. And the idea in a nutshell, and you probably all know about this better than I do, is that we could now make lectures and course materials and syllabi that we could reach people in every part of the world, whether they could come to a school like Williams or not, and it would transform the world. And they, they were as... Um, they were as passionate and idealistic. I mean, it's like they had just converted to a new religion. They were so excited about what they were offering. My first reaction to that as a college professor at a, at a kind of old-fashioned place that loves tradition was, forget it. That could never replace what happens to people on a campus like Williams. But I'm also a psychologist, so the next minute I thought to myself, wait a minute, what does happen at a place like Williams? And actually, because of that, it, I launched a whole new line of research about uh, the way in which places like Williams do and don't have an intellectual impact on their students. So I think that the ramifications of the digital toolkit are quite huge, and leads me to just one last point, and then I'll introduce the people you're really here to speak to, which is that in the end, thinking about digital cool toolkits in terms of a liberal arts setting requires us to think about what we believe the purpose of a liberal arts education is. And um, I imagine that some of you will talk about the sort of professional uses or, or the professional goals people have when they come to a school like Williams, uh, but that some of you will be interested in talking about the non-professional goals of a school like Williams, the way in which we're not here to prepare people for a job, we're here to make sure that people are educated in some broader sense. And I think the question of how our digital toolkits sort of speak to that is an important one. I'm, I'm eager to hear what people have to say about that. Okay. That, those are my opening comments. Uh, I have incredibly illustrious friends and colleagues up here. And I, I said before to Mary Hinton, I said, I'm not going to give you a very formal introduction because these people know you and they can read about you in the handout or whatever. And she said, yeah, don't be formal. For all I know, we took showers together. <laughs> yeah, we don't need... So <laughs> I'm not going to... I had to say that. You gave me that perfect line. Um, but... Um, all the way over on my left uh, is Mary Hinton, who uh, studied psychology here and um, studied with my good friend Lori Hetherington, uh, but went on to get a PhD in religious studies and now is the president of the College of St. Benedict. Um, sitting next to her is John Spear, who's the director of college counseling at Northwood School. I bet you're each going to tell a little about yourself, right? I hope, I hope. Okay. Uh, and um, next to him is Kate Queenie, but people here knew her as Katie. And so I have to say Katie Queenie, because she said that makes everybody laugh. Uh, Katie Queenie, who is professor of chemistry at Smith College. Um, and finally, right to my left, Derek Schilling, who's professor of French at Johns Hopkins. And each of them is going to talk about this topic in whatever way they want. Then I'm going to make a few comments to pull it together, ask a question, and then I hope that you will have plenty of questions because that'll be the most fun part of it. Okay, oh, you're next. You go. Thanks, thanks, Suzanne. The members of the class of 92, for the most part, were born around 1970, 69, 71, give or take a bit. It means that we're non-natives. All of us are non-natives. That is, we're not digital natives. And this is a fundamental social fact that has pretty deep repercussions, I think, about the way that we frame problems and also the way that we've accommodated our ways of thinking to the current media landscape and the research landscape. When we applied to Williams around about 1988, maybe 87, I don't remember when the applications were due in, but we, we typed them up. 
We typed them up and we had look good paper, or we had a self-correcting typewriter with a ribbon on it. Some of us had computers in the home. They were used on occasion, but we had dot matrix printers, so it didn't come out looking so good. This too is important because we, fundamentally, we were still participating in a culture that had been revolutionized by the typewriter in a way, but that still had continuities with, let's say, the Renaissance. We turned to books regularly. We marked them up. We took them with us. We had dog-eared copies of books that we loved, and we took that as a given. How many dog-eared copies of books that people love do you see walking around campus now? Probably a lot still, but in different, in different proportions and probably different types of books too. So thinking about how we framed research problems and how we went about getting information, putting together arguments, uh, I think is a one, one, one way to start in. And I want to just think back to uh, a disappeared building, Sawyer. Look for it, you're not going to find it. It wasn't a great building, but it's a building that all of us spent lots of time in. And some of us were forcibly evicted around uh, 5 to 1 in the morning when uh, they decided they had to close up. So what we had access to was largely circumscribed by the holdings in Saw Sawyer Library, which is a very good liberal arts library, or was at the time. The card catalog was not yet obsolete, although a lot of the data had been migrated. Right? Um, I don't know if anybody here worked uh, entering information at that, at that point, but you could find much of the holdings through computer workstations, but not everything. There were only a few computer workstations, so it wasn't a, a given that you would necessarily go there. And the scale and the scope of those holdings in Sawyer Library were really commensurate with what our professors expected us to familiarize ourselves with in our disciplines. And there was a nice equilibrium there um, insofar as there was a core of materials as well as other materials that were really handpicked by the faculty of Williams College. Let's say journals, for example, journals that were important to the field and then journals that were somewhat more peripheral to that core, but that resonated with the research specialties of the faculty here. And the result is that disciplines, different fields, appeared to us as compact and cohesive because they could be visualized, they could be visited in the stacks, you would see how many linear feet of X subject were out there. Because publication has continued to pace and because space needs on universities and college campuses across the nation have been, become very acute, you see lots of holdings being put in service centers, so they, they become remote, and you don't necessarily have that immediacy anymore. I think one of the great privileges of, of being part of this generation that was not digitally native and that spent lots of time in libraries at the time uh, was precisely the discovery, uh, this, this rush that you can get when you go to the stacks and you see that not only the book that you thought you, you really needed speaks to you, but the one next to it and another three down and another on the shelf above it. So there was that kind of leisurely browsing that led to all sorts of new uh, insights. These processes still take place, but in a very different way, and they're largely done through aggregation of websites and rankings, and they're done by corporations that ne aren't necessarily connected to the discipline. So when a student today does a, does a keyword search, they may get reams of information, 10,000 different hits, but the question is, how are those going to be hierarchized? How are they going to be aggregated? How useful is that information that's given to them? So thinking back to our experience at Williams, in part, I think it was absolutely essential that we had the one-on-one -on -one time with professors who could say, this is a journal that you want to look at. This is a resource that you absolutely can't miss out on. And that kind of cur curator function that scholars played for us, saying, this is the next thing to read, and there's a sequence that should be followed here, because you're not going to really appreciate this until you've read you know, this, this more basic text. And it allowed us, I think, intellectually to, again, to see our fields as cohesive and compact. And today, the, that, that, I think that notion has been exploded. Um, internet came online roughly at the, you know, 97. I think, the, I, I didn't send a, an email until graduate school, actually. I didn't send a single email in college here. I wasn't in Jessup where there was some of that use. But um, the fact that the classes of, let's say, 2002, 2007, 2012, and so on, can see themselves as not necessarily digital natives, but almost fully so, it distinguishes them from us in a, in a fundamental way. So I think 
this generation has struggled to some extent to try to adapt our disciplinary questions, our research methods, to uh, the kinds of things that are now possible. And I have to say, archiving has been an amazing thing, digital archiving for, let's say, the study of rare books, manuscripts, uh, any historical materials that are hard to access. Instead of having to go to Slovenia or to Berlin or uh, any, any research uh, library, you can often get the content over, um, over, uh, over the internet. And with increasing resolution, as memory becomes more uh, cheaper, the fact that libraries are able to, to, um, to upload this content. So, more uh, pertinently about teaching, I, I work in a modern language department where I also teach film. And one thing that's happened in colleges and universities is that the language labs have almost all been phased out. I don't know how many of you studied a language at Williams. Uh, you probably were using cassettes and headphones and repeating, uh, trying to say chtiri or mnyaza vut derek or pas maxtu or buongiorno, right? You're, you're trying all these sounds. And, it's important to phonate. You have to get the words out. Today, when you see people in a, in a cafe with laptops, you don't hear a lot of people phonating and getting the words out. So that's been a, a concern for me as a language educator in part. What does it take to get into that zone where you can actually produce language without, let's say, disturbing the piece? <laughs> um, and there are ways to do it. There are wonderful voice thread. Uh, application so that you can have interaction with your professor that's oral but non-synchronous. Same, same with chat, you know, chat rooms, which is synchronous, or uh, message, message boards with, with threads. I think, um, for, for me, the other area that's changed quite a bit is film studies. We used to have to be able to, you know, to thread a Bell and Howell projector, and you couldn't really count on the, the ball being good, and then sometimes you'd burn the, burn the, uh, the film. Um, it happens. But the DVD age has been a boon uh, for, uh, for scholars in, in film studies. The question of illustration with frame captures, just screen grabs, but also being able to record very, very brief sequences has made it possible to illustrate an argument in film studies, something that was not possible before. You had to go through what basically what the rhetoricians call ekphrasis, you know, so describing an image, but describing a moving image is even harder than describing a painted image in many cases. So, um, the last, last thing I'd just like to touch on is um, precisely the, the, the student-professor relationship, and I think, as Susan said, th there's, there's pluses and minuses in all of it. Um, a minus being when a student is chuckling and you're talking about uh, concentration camps in colonial Algeria, and you know that the student who's looking at a, a laptop is not paying attention. <laughs> I didn't forget that one. I, I did not forget that one. I'm not going to live it down. Um, but the, the idea of uh, not just synchronous communication, but the possibility to react uh, within the space of a, of, of, a, of a second and to have a live discussion uh, with a, a classroom of 10, 15, 20, let's say 25 students is really one of the most uh, in, engaging and uh, passion uh, raising things I can, I can imagine. So that's one, one thing that I think has remained a constant in the liberal arts frame, that is the possibility of face-to-face -face thinking and articulating something collectively, bringing multiple individual perspectives in with that. And if digital tools are helping that, so much the better. Um, so if you saw us come in, you could see we were all trying not to sit next to Susan just so we didn't have to go first. Um, but now I'm thinking it's like a miscalculation to go after uh, the humanist on the panel. <laughs> it's really articulate. Um, so as Susan said, I'm a chemistry professor. Um, and so when we first started talking about this panel, um, the really actually the last thing that Derek just mentioned, the sort of the face-to-face -face and, and how we deal with students was really what, uh, what came to mind for me. So I'll just say quickly, as a scientist, I think, um, and as somebody who's not a digital native, so I now take for granted all the ways that those tools help us do science so that I don't even really think of it anymore. So, um, and my little non-digital native story is I did once in graduate school actually, because my advisor was, was too cheap to buy peak fitting software, um, I actually cut peaks out and weighed them once. I see the chemistry professor giving me a thumbs up. Um, so, 
so I think there are great advantages. And in teaching, even, I think about, for me, one of the great advantages for digital tools is visualization. So talking about things that are sort of you know, three-dimensionally complicated and being able to show those to students, and that's, that's a huge boon to teaching. Um, but it also, you know, brings me to sort of a downside, which is I've come to realize, I think, that the digital natives um, that we're teaching have lost maybe some skills in sort of interpreting and drawing simple pictures. So I find that my students struggle to understand perspective in drawings, which makes me worry about sort of art education um, at the secondary level. Um, but I want to focus on this issue of sort of what digital habits students bring with them and how that impacts teaching in a liberal arts setting. Um, so what I hear a lot when I'm talking to students either in my class or they're talking about another class they're in, again, particularly in STEM fields, um, is I get this sentence a lot, I didn't understand what we did in class today, so I watched a con video. Um, and so those of you with kids will know these are Khan Academy videos. Um, and they're actually fantastic if you, if you look at them. They're these, um, you know, they're accessible to anyone. So if you're at a high school, a lot of my students come from high schools where the books are really crummy or non-existent. Um, you don't need those. You can learn just about anything in general chemistry or organic chemistry um, from a Khan Academy video. Um, so they're wonderful. And it gives students a lot of choices in how they want to try to learn or to supplement their learning. Um, to me, the biggest con for these, no pun intended, I just saw that, um, is that the students who talk about this, and there may be students who are using these a lot who aren't talking about them, the students I see who talk about this are generally still really struggling with the material. So they're using this as a strategy to, you know, to supplement learning with, with online digital tools, and yet it's not working for them. And so I think a lot about why that is. I think Susan um, mentioned thinking about massive open online courses, and when that became a really big issue a few years ago, um, every time I read an article about it, the course that people would use as an example was chemistry. So if you read the New York Times was constantly saying, we're gonna teach chemistry by MOOC, so I thought I should pay attention to this. Um, so, so I think a lot about what is it that I do, and you know, if it could be replaced by that, maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that. Um, so in, in ways, I mean, videos are just like textbooks, and students use them the same way I think that they could, or some of them do use textbooks. I think online videos to a lot of students are much more engaging. Um, but whether you're watching a video or reading a textbook or sitting in a lecture, and I'll say a little bit more about what a lecture I think is, um, there's no real learning that happens just by watching these things. And so, um, you know, I have colleagues who've studied this a little more when students watch those videos and actually do what they should, which is stop the video and try to solve the problem before the video solves it, then that's a real way to learn. The same way you don't really learn from reading a chemistry textbook, you have to work the sample problems um, and see how that goes. Um, but to me, a, an even bigger issue than that is just that videos are really good at teaching algorithmic problem-solving processes. So um, if you want to know how to solve a limiting reagent problem in chemistry, you can learn that really well from a video. And those skills are necessary to be a chemist in that case, but they're not really sufficient. And then there's the other issue, which is at a liberal arts college, most of the students that I teach in chemistry or that people would teach in a language class, they're not going to go on to be French scholars or chemists. So we should be teaching them things that are, that are useful beyond that particular uh, knowledge content set. So I think, you know, that liberal arts education broadly is supposed to give students the ability to tackle complex problems. So apply different skill sets and different knowledge bases. Um, and what's really hard for students, even if they've mastered those algorithmic skills, whether they're using face-to-face -face instruction or, or digital instruction, um, it's really hard for them, for us, to solve problems that don't just appear on the page as, you know, this is a limiting reagent problem. So solve, you apply your limiting reagent algorithm. And, you know, I've only been teaching for 17 years, but the only way that I have found to help try to teach that kind of problem solving process is to do it, and is to do it with students um, and have them do it with each other. So back to, I said I would say a little bit about a lecture, I think, um, Lecture is just our term, at least where I teach, it's our term for a class that is not a lab and is not a studio, I think, and maybe it's not a seminar, but I, I think there's a lot, most lectures or many lectures are not a person standing up at the front of the room speaking and people just passively listening or taking notes. Um, so I had someone, I was doing a study um, actually about digital tools and I had a student sit in my class and code the time 
just so I could see how we were spending time. And so she chose a bunch of random classes. And this was in an 80-person general chemistry class. And 33% of the time, it was a first semester class, was lecturing. It was me presenting information that I was presenting to students that was new or at least new in that class. And the rest of the time was talking. The rest of the time was students talking to each other, students talking in back and forth with me, um, or me just listening to students. Um, and that's important because what we were doing was solving problems. Sometimes we're solving problems that I'd given them, sometimes we're solving a question that someone had asked. But I think students can't learn to do that until they you know, listen to how other people solve problems. So everybody does it differently. Um, how does that person do it? I think really importantly, often when we do that, we do it badly. So you know. We pose a problem and um, students have answers that aren't good. And so then they have to learn what do I do when I have a dead end because I've, <laughs> I've gone, I haven't applied the right skill set. And so we do that a lot. Um, and so I think that part of learning um, is just something that can't be reproduced really with, without some kind of interpersonal contact. And there are complicated platforms that try to allow that online, um, but it's hard to do with 80 people. I think if you're not, you can, you know, I've seen some platforms for sort of eight people doing that digitally. Um, I think the other thing about the face-to-face -face education, so this is really just about not digital, I'm realizing, but um, is that, you know, the class goes in directions that are meaningful to students. And that's something that when we talk about this at my college, we think about more easily in disciplines that we think of students having a personal connection to, and chemistry is not usually that. Um, but there are meaningful directions in chemistry in terms of what students don't understand or what they care about. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that, so I think that the face-to-face -face teaching is really important because I can send you to a video if I know what you're going to need to learn. But if I don't know what you're going to need to learn, I have to be in conversation with you to find that out. And so I wanted to end, actually, um, with a quote from a Williams student that I heard a few years ago about this um, but that has really stuck with me because, um, you know, the personal interactions with faculty and that face-to-face -face connection, that just makes us feel good as humans and I wouldn't discount that, that's a good thing, but I think it needs, for, for how much it costs in every sense, it needs to have some value greater than that. So this student, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote, the student was talking about that one-on-one -on -one interaction with faculty and how important it is um, and he said, well, it, it's important, you know, in this case he was saying that the faculty member come to my like, uh, dance performance um, because we have to be comfortable enough with each other to do uncomfortable work in the classroom. And so that relationship building, and again, uncomfortable work in a chemistry classroom is not so much about the content but about our relationship to it. So it's uncomfortable to say I have no idea what you're talking about and I don't know how to do this. Um, and so for students to, to be uncomfortable enough to say that, I think is something that's hard to reproduce digitally. It occurs to me sitting here that um, when when I was in here at college with uh, with many of you, I um, a, a theme of my experience was uh, was just intimidation. Um, like I was in a classroom with all these smart people, and um, and I found myself more likely to seek the professor during office hours than to speak in class and. And I realized that, that Heather's call to ask me to participate in this panel was some kind of revenge or uh, <laughs> some payback for, for all those classes when I was, when I was silent. I want to speak about, um, about the college admissions process um, because that's what I do and that's what I, what I know. I'm a college counselor. I've been doing it for most of the time since, um, since we graduated. And, uh, and I know that many of you have have uh, children that are deep in the process or just went through it, or um, so it might be interesting. Um, and, and technology has drastically changed how this whole process works, and there's a lot to talk about, and I hear there are, there are plenty of receptions for us to, to dig in to more later on. But I, I wanna um, give you a, a brief history of, of college counseling, because I think it leads to technology, and it also, um, explain some of how a place like Williams has changed since maybe our grandparents' um, um, uh, generation. Uh, and um, so college counseling, or what, what I do, has changed. Uh, it used to be called college placement. Um, and, um, and my admissions officer at my school still wants to call it college placement, but it's not. But it used to be 
that. And I'm talking, this is, you know, our, uh, maybe our grandparents' generation. Maybe if we're, um, our parents are old enough, it was the parents where the headmaster would actually, or, you know, the, the, the person in charge of the school would get on the phone and say, I've got a kid for you. And they talk about the kid, the kid would be placed. Go to the next kid, the next kid, the next kid. If I look at the yearbook at the school I teach at, a little um, uh, boarding school, you know, no superstar students or anything, just a, um, you know, a small boarding school struggling to make it um, in the 1930s and 40s, um, just about all the kids were going to Ivy League, Amherst Williams, um, you know, and it was, that's how it worked back then. Um, I'm 25 years out when uh, um, my classmates and uh, w when we were applying, it was a different model. It wasn't placement anymore. It was more guidance, um, so college guidance. And the, 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 think of the, that word. It means that there's a path, sort of a clear path, and there's an expert, a college guidance counselor or just a guidance counselor who would sort of walk you down that path. And... Um, and in both of these models, the universe of students that are coming to, to Williams is really small, right? The first model with placement is there's a small group of schools that sort of feed a place like, like Williams. With guidance, things were a little, a little different, um, but it was still um, adult-focused, expert-focused. Um, you know, imagine a person walking you down a path to, um, through the process, and the process was pretty much the same for, for everyone. Um, and, and that's changed, and it's changed around the same time as the internet, but I don't think it's a causation thing, uh, to college counseling. Um, so I'm the director of college counseling, um, and that title's just changed recently. It used to be the director of college guidance, and I said, we have to change this, this title. But so this era, um, the director of when you're college counseling is um, there are many paths and the, um, the purpose of college counseling is to help students get to know themselves, to help students find um, the right fit. And, um, and then, so now that the, the universe of, of potential students is significantly larger. And, uh, and I bet, I haven't done this research, but I bet if you take a look at the number of high schools represented at Williams right now from, you know, the first years to seniors and compare it to the number of high schools represented when we were there, it's a huge difference. And, and that's really good. Um, college is more accessible. A place like Williams is more accessible to, to more people. It's a, it's a more diverse group. There are more first generation students. So that has, um, that's changed significantly in say 50 years. Um, in the last 10 years or so, college counseling has changed to more virtual counseling. And um, so it's online. There are a lot of algorithms now. There are a lot of websites um, where you fill out a form and it spits out scholarships you should apply to or, or colleges you should look at. Um, one thing that you might know, if you have a kid who took the SAT and you help them register for the test, you know this. Uh, when, you, um, when we registered for the SAT, it was maybe four pages at the most, maybe even two pages of sort of bubble in things and you send it into the college board in New Jersey and they'd register you for the test. Now, it's all online, of course. Um, they have a little screen with a picture of a couch and it tells you to get comfortable because this is gonna take a while. <laughs> and I, I swear, it's, um, if um, a lot of times I'll guide the student through and, and say, you don't need to answer that, you don't need to just go through it. But if they do it on their own and answer every question, it's easily 90 minutes. And um, the reason it is, is because they're asking all these questions, and there are two reasons for these questions. They're asking, you know, um, what courses did you take? What are your interests? What are your extracurricular activities? All that kind of stuff. And there's a cynical reason, and there's a, um, a virtuous reason. The cynical reason is that the college board collects all this data and they sell it to colleges and universities to market to prospective students. Um, but there's a virtuous reason too. And, um, and let me just say one fact first, that most schools now have um, one counselor for between two and 300 students. Right? In California, it's more like five, 600 students. I'm from a rural area in upstate New York and um, so the school districts are much smaller, but there's one counselor from like pre-K to 12. Imagine a counselor from pre-K to 12 and the, the different 
things you're doing. And you may only have 15 seniors, but how much time are you able to give to them when you're, you know, you're focused on, on uh, you know, individualized learning plans for the you know, pre-K students? Um, so with that in mind, that there are so, the counselors have so much on their plate that the college board and other organizations are trying to offer these services to students. And um, so offer college counseling. And um, so they have this website, it's called Big Future, and there are a whole bunch of other websites where you type in this information, uh, you give them personal information, they may mark it to you or not. Um, it's never clear for the students. And, um, and then, then there are these algorithms that start spitting out um, colleges, and the students don't know, are these colleges recommended because they're, they're, they're sponsored? Like, the did the college pay for this or not? And it's never, it's often not clear. Um, and uh, so this digital uh, change in college counseling means this, the information is so robust. There's so much out there. Um, but it's hard to tell um, who's in charge of this information and what are their motives. And here's what's, what's disappointing or what's, um, what's surprising to me. First, I'll, I'll do on this little tangent. There's a lot of people will say, our oh, kids these days are not as smart. No, they're way smarter now. They're, uh, they're, the, the talented kids uh, from my school and other schools that are going to Williams are, um, um, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself, they're way better than I was, and they're probably way better than most of, most of my classmates. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're really capable, good critical thinking skills, writing, they're, they're, it's really impressive. Um, but when it comes to information about the college search, they become um, they become idiots, <laughs> they, right? So I have a kid, I, I, I'll put like Bucknell on a student's list and say, I need you to research this school. I think this is a good fit. He comes back and Bucknell's not on the list anymore. And why not? Because, you know, my brother's um, coworker says it's a party school. Like, what? And you, so that's the critical thinking skills. They just sort of cross it off. And, <laughs> and um, so it's, it's, it's loony. But they write the best AP papers. They do great arguments in school. Um, so this, I mean, it's, it's all about media and literacy, um, and um, so we're, we're working on it, but we're not, we're not there yet for sure. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was that, well, I'm not gonna say anything else. I'm gonna, um, I'll, I'll yield the floor to you. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so I just want to note for the record, I've staked my entire professional career on those young people you just described, but <laughs> I'm not nervous. <laughs> um, so I, I actually want to start by thanking Heather and Chris and Susan for the opportunity to talk with you. And although I'm the only one using a digital device on the stage, I actually want to argue against the digital toolkit, particularly as it relates to the liberal arts. And I, I think about the liberal arts often. I had the great fortune of leading a purely residential liberal arts school for 1,900 young women. And I think without the liberal arts, the digital toolkits are actually meaningless, um, is my way of thinking, or at least I want to put that out there. Because to my way of thinking, without the skills that we learned in a liberal arts environment, I think the digital world lacks meaning. So I want to talk a little bit about that and then a bit more broadly about what the digital age means in higher education, generally speaking. So I want to give an example to try to make my case about the sort of the vagaries of the digital toolkit. One of the things that I'm often asked to speak about because I lead a college for women is people will task me with speaking about women's leadership. So you could, with a fairly unsophisticated digital toolkit, go online and find out a great deal about women's leadership. In fact, if you do a cursory Google search, thousands of articles will appear that have women's leadership in them. And as a result of this, if you just take what the digital toolkit gives you, you could find yourself making some really um, concerning statements. So I did this yesterday, so I would have very current information. So I go to Google, I put in women's leadership. One thing you'll note is that the, often the preponderance of the articles that appear are actually written by men. So that's one thing you should know. So I put in women's leadership. 
And I, up pops this one article from Forbes, and at one point it says that he's explaining why there aren't more women in leadership roles. And his whole premise is that, well, because men take more international assignments than women do, men have greater faith in themselves in challenging situations than women have. And that's his whole thing. The reason why women aren't, met, aren't meeting greater success in the corporate world is because we don't take as many international assignments. And then he goes on, and he the article ends. But he also speculates that women may not get as many opportunities as men because of discrimination in the workplace. So I find that interesting that I had to read all about these international data to get to the speculative point about women's opportunities. So if you just rely on the digital toolkit, you could end up there and, and talking about women's leadership from that place. Or another article on Forbes from yes, that I pulled up yesterday is this man says, it can be difficult for a man to understand how women think, act, and innovate unless he's been closely influenced by the women in his life. I've grown to understand their decision-making processes, the dynamics and subtleties of their personality and style, and other special character qualities that women possess. So let's say you're going to give a talk about women's leadership, and you happen to land on these two items in your digital toolkit. What does this mean? Like, what are these two statements? And you can find lots of statements there. But what do they mean, and what are the implications of what they're saying for you as you think about this information? So I think a digital toolkit can provide you with information, but I don't think it provides you with knowledge, and I surely don't think that it necessarily provides you with wisdom. I think a digital toolkit um, doesn't enable you to curate the information that you have, and that's what a liberally educated mind is able to do. A liberally educated mind would look at these Google results and just at least think about the question of why are so many of the articles written by men. They would interrogate the perspective of the writer. They'll question why some of the articles are so reductionist and essentialist in saying that because you possess two X chromosomes, you must lead in this particular way. A digital toolkit doesn't force you to ask questions of intersectionality. It won't ask if what's true for one group of women holds true for another group of women across context. And it won't push you to ask the questions of why or why not. So in my mind, the digital toolkit gets you a short distance in the race whereas a liberally educated mind helps you think about why are you in this race and what does it mean. There's a relatively new book out called The Fuzzy and the Techie, and it's about someone who's in Silicon Valley, as I believe he's a humanist writing this book, and talks about why the liberal arts are so essential in understanding even our tech world. Because technology is ideally in service of something, but it's humanist and scientist to understand why do people behave the way they do? Why do we make the decisions that we do? And that we need those liberally educated people in minds in order to even drive the technology that we want or that we need. And I'll just end, I have two other key things that I think makes digital toolkits sort of uh, less than helpful at times. A digital toolkit is not particularly helpful, I think, when you're engaging in the early sort of embryonic stages of knowledge discovery and generation, when you're at that fragile point of trying to figure out the questions. Yes, a digital toolkit can help you present information. It can help feed some of those early questions, but it's every individual's unique perspective that they bring that forms those big questions of life, that help you make meaning of what's happening in the world around you. And a digital toolkit can move you further down the road, but those early questions come from introspection and dialogue with one another and dialogue in a classroom. So I think we wanna be careful with assuming that the digital toolkit can do that, that early, early piece of knowledge, discovery, and generation. And secondly, and, and for me, this is actually the most important question around digital toolkits, is who controls access to the very best digital toolkits? So who controls whether or not we all get the same toolkits? Who controls who's designing the toolkits and to what end? 
Now, I certainly realize that a digital product in and of itself um, doesn't discriminate, right? It's, it's a tool, it's technology. But it also doesn't necessarily support movement towards inclusion that I think you're seeing across higher ed. We don't all get the same digital toolkit, whether it's in our K-12 worlds or even in higher ed. We're not all equipped with the same digital toolkit. By way of example, a student who comes to campus with her own MacBook or PC has a lot more opportunity than a student who is reliant on the computer center if they can even find where that is. So a digital toolkit I don't think is any more equitable in the real world. And they, the toolkit is controlled by who gets to distribute them, who controls the information in them, who gets to design them. Is the digital toolkit available for someone who has, um, who's visually impaired? And how do we make it available in an equitable fashion? Without a liberally educated mind, you don't get to question who gets access to the toolkit or who designed the toolkit. And I think that a liberal arts mind thrives in those questions and we thrive in challenging those questions. So I would just argue that um, a digital toolkit cannot set you free in the same ways that a liberally educated mind can, both for an individual and then when the individual goes back to their communities, the way that they can help their community thrive as well. Okay, oops, I forgot my non-digital tool of a pen. So I didn't take notes while you were talking. Let's see how good I am on the, um, on the fly like this. Uh, those were wonderful. And I actually did hear some themes in there that I want to identify for the group and then open it up to you to ask questions. So three things jumped out at me as I listened to the four of you speak. One was what it means to be an active learner at the college level. So I'm interested in K-12 education. And for those of you in that world, we talk a lot, or if you, know, you have, have kids, you know what it means to be an active learner, K through 12, you get up, you do things, you make things, you walk around the room, you cut, you paste. But actually, what I heard today was a dilemma about what it means to be an intellectually active learner and the way in which digital tools help that and hinder it. So, because there's some things you can't do, as you mentioned, without actually trying the problem. Like, just getting it online is no better than just reading it in a textbook or hearing someone tell it to you. And you talked in a variety of ways about the role of sort of self-efficacy or self intellectual self-determination in, in learning. And I'm just interested in what your thoughts are about how to make sure that our students remain active learners in the face of this great seduction uh, of the digital toolkit. So that's one thing I, I'm interested in hearing people talk about, which is what it means to be an active learner with this incredible allure of tools that can help you be more independent. You can look for more stuff. You can try stuff out online. There are all kinds of ways it could make you more independent and active, but I think you've identified some of the ways in which it could also kind of immobilize you or, you know, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing that you that came up again and again was this sense of relationship. And I something occurred to me um, when you were talking, Kate, about lecture. You know what happens in a classroom versus what happens online. If you watch a lecture online or go to the Khan Academy, and I realized the great value for me of lecturing to my students is I can actually spit on them and they feel it, and that's the truth. Now that I'm older, I'm I get all excited and I'm talking, I'm jumping around the room, and suddenly I realize I'm like sprays flying out. But it's disgusting. Yeah, I won't do it to you. I'm but honestly, joking aside that the thing that kept coming up was what happens between people in a liberal arts education that actually requires real people who spit, who have smells, who have feels to them, and who are in the room in all kinds of unexpected ways with each other, not just the professor and his or her students, but the students with one another. Because one of the things I think all of you will know and think back to your own educational experience is there's a difference between learning in a room with a lot of other people and learning with one another. And there may be ways that 
digital learning enhances that, but it's an issue. What kind of community does it allow us to have and keep us from having? Because, I mean, and I can say here in my own research on college education, it's becoming clearer and clearer that if there is a cumulative impact of a liberal arts education, it has to do with what happens between people as they move from the classroom out of the classroom to the dining hall or the gym or the log. Um, so I think that sense of relationship and community is something else you mentioned. The third issue that kept coming up and totally intrigues me is the relationship between certainty and uncertainty in liberal arts education. Because on the one hand, you talked about, and as professors and teachers, we want students to get knowledge, to become certain of certain things. But also, for those of us who teach, um, we want them to become interested in what they're uncertain about and to know the difference. Uh, and to be drawn, I'm very interested in what makes people comfortable with uncertainty. And it seemed to me that's something that you were talking about. So, John, you mentioned the dangers of taking information from a friend's uncle. And Mary talked about the dangers of taking information from online. And the truth is, God, did we ever know that as well as we know it now? Information can be true or untrue. <laughs> A lot of us don't know the difference. But honestly, seriously, that's part of our job, to help people not just detect fact from fiction, but be interested in the relationship between certainty and uncertainty. And I think that's something that you all, I didn't expect to hear you talk about, but that I think is very interested, interesting for us to think about in relation to the digital toolkit. So that's, I'll just, those are the three themes that I think sort of brought you together. And I'd just like to ask you a question, because Mary ended with it. What, in all of this, there's an implicit assumption about what a college education is for. And I'd love to hear some of you talk about that in relation to the digital world, because it may or may not have changed that, but it came up even in our introduction when we were learning about what we were going to do in this panel. So if you wanted to equip people for jobs, you might feel you had to teach them how to navigate the digital world. But if you didn't think of that as your goal, you must have some other goal, and that might shift your, your goals for incorporating digital tools into your, into your work as a counselor and or a college-level teacher. So does anybody have an answer to that? I'm good with silence. I, sem I lead seminars, so I'll give you a minute. <laughs> No, I don't have an answer for that, but I, I, um, something changed um, in the college counseling world um, with the recession in 2007, 2008, where um, I saw, and many of my, my peers at other schools saw, very little tolerance for liberal arts education, even from, um, from uh, parents um, who have graduated from liberal arts schools, and it's been a long haul trying to uh, turn that around, and um, the what are you going to do with that? I mean, um, you know, with majoring in art or philosophy, or, or um, so there's a great pressure um, there that we that we face. And the the by the way, the, I, I love the New York Times. The New York Times writes like ten articles a year about a brown English major who's bartending somewhere and what a failure the, you know, the liberal arts are. And it drives me nuts that they, that they do that. And um, um, so it's out there in the, in the, in the media too. And, you know, um, so the, um, but we, I mean, we know, I don't have to argue the, the case for the liberal arts here, but, um, but the word isn't out. It's, um, it's an uphill battle. Um, to communicate the value of a liberal arts education. I have students I counsel all the time that when they look at a liberal arts education, they say, what, I'm gonna major in math and how many math classes am I taking? And, and um, what am I gonna do with all these other classes? Why, why would they want me to take 20 classes that aren't math classes? And uh, uh, that's the default position for, uh, for many uh, students and families, and it's, uh, it's a lot of work, and it's slow work. One of the things that I'm grateful for is I work at a school where we have four counselors that are working with a senior class of 60 students. Could you imagine if there were 
there's one counselor for 500 students. And by the way, quick tangent that the, the solution that the popular solution for this counselor shortage, um, the public policy solution is better technology. And that's a disaster, I think. It's a, it's a disaster. It means more algorithms and more forms and less one-on-one -on -one interaction that, um, that is so valuable. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. One baseline thing for me as an educator, I think, is uh, getting students to the point at which they are self-confident enough that they know that they, their uh, academic integrity is impeccable. That is, we didn't speak about the question of plagiarism, but the generations that are digital natives have had it easy when it comes to plagiarizing. That is, if you go back 50 years, if you wanted to plagiarize, you had to copy out everything long, longhand and then maybe type it up. But, you know, cut and paste, we, this, is a, this is the culture that we live in. And as college professors, university professors, I think there's probably no one uh, greater civic duty than imparting those standards for academic integrity that will play on, play on in all of their uh, workplace situations and later, later in life. So um, that's, that's something where the digital interface poses all sorts of challenges and questions. And also the nature of, say, collaboration. At what point is collaboration, in fact, doing a disservice to students individually, that is, sharing work in certain ways? And this is something that's obviously going to, I think, be more uh, of, a, of a concern in, in, in your field, uh, Kate, with, with, uh, with, with, with labs and problem sets, whereas in the humanities and social sciences, or at least in the humanities, it's often more an, an individual kind of uh, uh, affair. But that, uh, the question of academic integrity, I think, is absolutely fundamental to what liberal arts and education can do. And, I mean, I would just, back to your initial question, Susan, I think that you know, college prepares students for life afterwards in every way, and I think a key part of that is their jobs. And it's, you know, we all know it's usually more than one job now, so very few students will go into a job and do that job forever. And I think that, um, you know, other articles that people like to publish about how college students don't learn anything, but if you look really carefully at those studies, the college students who do liberal arts degrees actually do learn, like their writing improves a lot. Um, and, and skills that are transferable across all the jobs that students will have. And I, I think that, um, you know, what, what people touched on is that, you know, the student body has changed a lot at Williams and at schools like Williams since most of us were in college. And I think that when you have students come in who they're already, you know, playing a role supporting their families um, and worrying about supporting themselves while they're there, I think it's really, um, it's important to be upfront with them that a major goal of what we're doing is to help them achieve financial stability afterwards, and that, that that's not just the domain of pre-professional training, but that really is, I mean, if you look at how our graduates do, liberal arts colleges do a very good job um, in helping students um, earn a really good living afterwards. So I don't think that has to be a, not that you were saying it was at all, but that that's something that, you know, we should be comfortable with as well. I just want to add, you talked about certainty and uncertainty, and I'll need to think through that even more, but there's this interesting way that the internet and the advent of technology has in some ways increased people's sense of self-certainty. So I could limit my life and isolate my digital life to only include people who think exactly as I think. And if I do that successfully, I could actually get to a point where I assume if you don't think exactly like me, then you're automatically wrong and I can cast you in a very negative light. So one of the things that I really am concerned about is how our students and our society in general, I think, is finding their own echo chambers to dwell within. And I think that's really hindering our ability to take the perspective of another to be willing to hear from someone else. And I think a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now um, in the States, and I, and I think globally to some degree, is that we've isolated ourselves and become so sure of our own perspectives that we automatically deride or deny or denigrate the perspective of another. And I think technology has done that. I think we were all optimistic that technology was gonna open up a whole new world. When for many people, it has sort of closed their world and closed their mind. And because you can find others who just agree with you in your own little area of the internet, that can be, I think, 
tricky and problematic at times for us in terms of thinking about the national good and, and the future and health of our citizenry. I'm a college president. I have the advantage of knowing Mary and admiring Mary from that area, uh, area of the Sage Colleges. And this question of the liberal arts, it, it's hard to get the word out, and we're trying to do that a lot with the Council of Independent Colleges. But the people with a liberal arts education do better in just about every career. And so I have people like the head of GE and the head of Global Foundries. We're, we're in Albany at the Sage Colleges, saying, I'd rather have somebody with a liberal arts education uh, because I can teach them the technical parts, but what I can't teach them is critical thinking. And the, the critical thinking, the inquiry are essential, and in relation to that, it being critical, I really appreciate your last comments there, but being critical of what's on the internet, knowing what to believe and what not to believe and how to sift through evidence, that's the kind of thing that we teach in the liberal arts. Yes. I'm going to slightly hijack this conversation for a second. My apologies. Paint grass, class of 67, retired psychiatrist. That's my. Uh, can't think of the word. Anyway, my concern is that with the intervention of the screen in human to interaction much is lost when extraordinary people like yourselves do not make eye contact with these extraordinary students that you're teaching. When I was here 50 years ago, God forbid, um, <laughs> I've long forgotten what my teachers taught me, but who they were as human beings and the fact that they would have passion at the front of the lecture hall and they knew my name and they believed in me more than I believed in myself. Uh, that is not something you can learn from screen. Uh, so I would urge you uh, to keep those ideas in mind as you embark on teaching the best and the brightest of your students. Uh, if you aren't already, to not forego or sacrifice the human element in your role as educators. I've had the privilege of being a teacher in my home medical school for years and uh, experimented with many different ways to get my message across. I no longer use PowerPoints. Uh, I stand at the lectern because I'm unsteady, but I make eye contact and I speak uh, spontaneously as I'm trying to do right now uh, when I speak or I have the privilege of meeting one-on-one -on -one, face to face with uh, trainees and as they will with their patients. And that sort of computer has infected the art of medicine these days. Most of us have doctors that never look at us and only look at us when they touch us and examine us. Uh, and we have to raise our voice to get their attention. Uh, so I plead with you to keep that in your toolkit, uh, your relationship toolkit. Sorry. Thank you. Well, I'm going to add a little comment there, but I see a lot of hands raised. One thing that I have to say, I'm going to be the devil's advocate here, is sometimes when people, especially when they ask me about the impact of digital stuff on children uh, and how much is being lost, I think about how people used to despair when printed material first became broadly accessible. And I imagine people saying, oh my God, we'll never have conversations again. Everyone will just be alone somewhere reading. And the reason I say that is the impact of technology on human life goes way back before the digital age. And it always feels sort of terrible to be losing whatever you knew as the center of civilization for something that you don't know that comes with all these bad side effects. And the reason I say that, even though in general, I totally agree with what you're saying, is that we are not going to give up iPhones and Google. We're going to get more powerful ones. We're going to get some other version we haven't envisioned, but they're here, just like the printed book is and the car. Well, the printed book may be going on its way out, but it was here for me. <laughs> and, you know, the car might be going out too. But, uh, 
And the reason I say that is that one thing that I'm very interested in and want to hear what people have to say about it and encourage the audience to think about it is they're here. So the question is, what do we do with them? Uh, because they're here. Um, and, and they have their wonderful side to them. We're never going to get a group of students to come to college and give up the digital world for four years, even if you would want to. So I, I think it's interesting for people to think proactively, OK, this is what we got. What are we going to do with it? Um, because you know, there's, there's no going back. Yes, in the back. You. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll make my observations brief, but then what I invite you to speak to it. I mean, I'm a public school teacher and been uh, teaching in a low income uh, community for 17 years. And I've seen a good. <laughs> and I think it, it's been a really interesting journey over those 17 years of seeing how technology has been rolled out. And I really appreciate Mary, you're bringing up thinking critically about uh, how technologies uh, particularly uh, are uh, consumed uh, by different uh, demographics. And so one of the things that concerns me a lot is obviously there, there are a lot of concerns about technology that we've seen. But in talking to my colleagues who, don't, uh, who teach in higher income communities, it really is a supplemental thing. And, uh, and in my community, I'm seeing a supplanting uh, a lot, and because we live in this age of scarcity of public school uh, resources and also this kind of cult of efficiency that uh, technology is, there used to be a digital divide in public education. I don't see that anymore. There's been tons of laptops and, and devices in, in these uh, poor schools, but it's supplanting a lot of what I see now as a critical thinking divide. And so I'm wondering if you observe that at all uh, with uh, students from um, kind of different socioeconomic backgrounds uh, coming in. Uh, because what I'm seeing is that the students I had uh, 17 years ago versus now really aren't that different. But I felt like it was a lot easier to engage in, um, in quests of inquiry and, and critical thinking uh, that are just a, a much more challenging now. And perhaps that's universal uh, among the, the distractedness of technology across the spectrum. But I'm wondering if you're, you're seeing that particularly um, uh, a divide in that regard uh, between the, uh, your hiring and lower um, students coming in. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's really hard. Um, I think it's really hard to sort out where those where those uh, differences in success and thriving come from. I think you know nationally. So again, I'm most familiar with with looking at students in STEM disciplines, and that's something that's studied a lot. So there are clear um, achievement and persistence gaps among you know various um, either underrepresented groups or. Um, you know, students from under-resourced schools. And, and, and your question is just, is a really good one to think about. And I don't, you know, I'm not aware, I haven't really thought about it that way. I would just say, it's just that they're clear, um, sort of, you know, it's not, I think often people at the college level, um, and I see this, you know, where I teach as well, we want to sort of address those gaps by thinking like, if we could just teach those students, say, more algebra, right? <laughs> like that would solve all the problems. And I think when you look at, I was just reading something, I mean, that to the extent that's been studied well, it doesn't seem to really work. And I think you just put a much more specific sort of description on what I think the problem is. It's not, in my experience, yeah, it's not that students just are lacking a particular math skill. It's that they're lacking, um, in part, you know, lacking what you described as sort of a critical thinking skill. So lacking the ability to sort of, you know, do things that aren't algorithmic and rote. And maybe that's because they're being taught those things. They're more likely to be taught those things um, in a particularly algorithmic, digital way. I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know, and again, I think some of it also is just, it's not really about this, but it bears repeating. I mean, some of it is because um, often those students are struggling with things that are completely outside the classroom um, in terms of, you know, financial pressures or family pressures that just, you know, touch on everything. But I think that's a really, a really interesting question that I don't have an answer for. We have time. I just found out we have to leave sooner than I thought. We have time for one more question and one more answer. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Kate Harris, and I'm class of 82. And I'm a big proponent of both technology and the rural education. 
get that out. <laughs> um, I'm really curious about what you guys are seeing technologically that is fostering sort of collaboration and study groups and the kinds of things that I think some technology has made kids lazy. They think they can solve everything on their own and not always work together and teach each other, which is where a lot of learning comes from inside the teaching that actually happens in the classroom. So do you guys have any like strong feelings about technology that is really helpful and helping people, you know, helping students teach each other and really go um, beyond the classroom into the kinds of discussions and conversations and study groups and, you know, really half of our education at Williams came from our fellow students. So is there any technological thing out there that's fostering that? One thing, and it may or may not be technological, is I think it's architectural, and that is the move from the traditional library space to learning commons. And the possibility of having a group of four, five, six people in a room reserved for two hours on an afternoon to work through a problem together. And with a wonderful uh, generalization of paint that works like a whiteboard, you can scrawl all you want on the walls and erase when you go, go out or leave it up there if you want. Um, and this is a, it's a very simple solution in some ways because it, it gives a structured space for collaborative uh, thinking and yet it's fairly cost effective. So I think that's been a, a, a salutary uh, move on the part of uh, libraries nationwide. Thank you. We have to end now because there's another panel coming in here, but you've been a wonderful audience and I think we want to thank your wonderful